Uh, this is an interview with Michael Lynch on December 16, 2000. Okay, yeah. Um, first thing I was going to say is, is that from, I have a lot of Marsha's belongings that were lent to me by Randy Wicker. Do you know Randy? Um, no. Okay, Marsha lived with it Randy. Was, yeah, in in Hoboken, Jersey, yes. Okay. And um, I have something from Jimmy that's addressed. You think he's still that's there? Him. That's him. That's okay. him. Because his phone isn't listed. And um, I guess what I'll do is I'll, I'll write him a letter. I think he's. Yeah, and he is listed. He is? Yeah. He's listed. C A M I C I A. C A M I C I A, yeah. I'll try it again. As a matter of fact, his uh, lover, Mark, is going to be up here tonight. Mark Henne. Mark Henne. Okay. Yeah, he's over here tonight. Oh, wow. And Joe Long. Are they going to be there at 5 o'clock? Yeah. So, can we be alright if I walk over there with you? Okay, yeah, and then uh, I'll go upstairs, it's a small place, and then. Yeah, I mean, I'll just go say hello to him and. Yeah. and okay. You know, um, because obviously Jimmy would probably be the best central contact for the hot yes. beaches people, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Okay. Jimmy is, because he right. is hot beaches. Yeah. Okay. Um, before I go any further, oh, actually. Um, did I tell you I'm a PhD student at the City University? No. Okay, I'm getting a PhD in history. So they have a requirement if I talk to live subjects. Just basically you have to sign saying that it's okay to be recorded. Okay. And, um, and that you can always contact me or my advisor if you ever want to know about the project. Okay, great. And if you just want to sign this one, you can keep that one. Okay. And I'll keep one. Alright. Kind of a bizarre thing. They designed this for people who are in uh, doing doctorates and things like biology and psychology. They're doing like experiments. Uh huh. Oh, okay. So what's the date? Today's the 16th. Yeah. Okay. So is this going to eventually be a book? I hope so. Okay. If I can get enough people to tell me enough information, yeah. You know, I have a wonderful picture of Martha and myself Great. in uh, London when uh -huh. we were doing the heat. Because I'm, I'm not at my apartment. I'm at my mother's, mother's house. Right. Yeah. So. I was like, if I can go over there, I would get it, but um, I can look at your copy of it. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. yeah, when the time comes, I would definitely okay. ask you about that. Now, I have a list of people here, um, and we can just go down, and then we'll talk about Marsha. This is all people I got through Marsha's stuff, and you know Alvin Baltrip? No, okay. I don't know. Jorge Barbon, that's not a problem, I know who he is. Bambi, well, you wouldn't know Bambi. Penny Arcade? Yeah, but okay. Okay. Um, but I assume these people, Jimmy, can give me. Yeah, Jimmy, out. right. Hey. Um, so this is the whole crowd here. Betty. Bet's yeah. going to be here January 5th over at New York Theatre Workshop in a show called yeah. Resident Alien about the life of Clinton Chris. Okay. It starts uh, January 5th. So I should be able to get in touch with her yeah. at New okay. York Theatre Workshop. Um, Ron Jones. Mm -hmm. Just go to the bar. <laughs> <laughs> just to put the bar. Oh, uh, bar he works bar. there? No, he's always there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he's sitting at the bar stool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the bar. That's in East Village, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, Jimmy, Tony. Price, he's no longer with right. us. Fish. He may be in Puerto Rico, but he lives on... Okay. Okay. Julia. Yeah, Julia Bears. I don't know what Julia is. That's great. Uh-huh. Mark. Yourself. Your sister. Uh-huh. Um, what was the other guy think? Tony Longo? Uh, Joe Longo. Joe Longo. He was Hot Peaches also, a founding member. L-O-N-G-O? Uh-huh. Oh, okay. All right, he's going to be there with Mark Hanay. Uh-huh. Okay, great. Um, the family, that's not an issue because I talked to them. They're helping me out. There is another... Um, the person who lives in the Bronx that was with um, uh, Hot Peaches years ago, Lola Star. Lola yeah. Star. Lola, um, you yeah. can ask Jimmy about Lola. Okay. Lola lives in the Bronx and she was, you know, no Marsha from the street. And all that's that. great. I do have that Perfect. Really, that's good. Um, so there's all these people, the family's helping me out. Are they all? Yeah, they're going to tell me everything about oh, good, Marcia's good. childhood, um, who they call Mikey. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> um, let's see. 
Any of these people, Emilio, Emilio, Comiero? Emilio, I, I know of him. Of him, okay. Uh, let's see. Jeremiah Newton, mm -hmm. okay. Michael Swerdlo? No, I don't know him. Okay, Bill Dobbs? No. Fox. Um, Susan Warren, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Chelsea, I think I can get that with probably. Probably? I've okay. heard Bob. I've heard of Bob. Okay. Not really. Exactly. Daniel Graham. Marcus Mayen. You know Andy Warhol did a picture of Bob. Yeah, do you know anything about, <laughs> that's one of my questions, do you know anything about when that picture was done? Jimmy would know all we'll about know all that, because the, aside from Marsha, Wilhelmina Ross was another person that they did the, uh, the pictures of, and Wilhelmina died and ended up in this retrospective at the Met or whatever it was. Okay. And I, Jimmy wrote a whole big piece about Wilhelmina, oh, great. and Marsha was one of those people that posed for Andy also. I contacted the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, and mm -hmm. I don't know, I think they just have this huge collection and they haven't figured out anything yet, Ooh, so they couldn't yeah. help me. Uh -huh. They said they have pictures, and they don't even know who they are. Uh -huh. um, let's see. Um, Shayla Bacow? She's Sheila. She did. She died. She did. Uh -huh. okay. Was this a transgender person? No, she was a woman. A woman, huh? Augusta Machado. Oh, they just got a card from Augusta. I had her Great. address, yeah, and everything at home. Okay. She's a right. wonderful person. He can tell you great stuff. Marge P. is a Hoboken. Um, they would know them. This is all Hoboken. Um, Barbara Yoshida? That's no, I don't know. Okay. Okay, that's all okay. oh, right. Um, also, your sister mentioned there was somebody that she thought's name was Linda Stein. That, oh, uh, Linda Stein. She's a friend of Jimmy's also. Great. Linda but Stein. she was doing a thesis or something. Oh, okay. Yeah, and Linda Stein. Uh, yeah, she's uh, another person that was so affiliated with Hot Peaches. Oh, she was. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. That's so good. All Hot Peaches. Oh, good. I mean, it's been really helpful here. Um, if you could just... Why don't you start up and just tell me a little bit about yourself. You're from the Bronx? Uh, yeah, from the Bronx. Okay. Um, I've been a performer for the past 35 years. I started when I was 14 years old. Um, you should say when you started when you were two. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I started very young, and uh, I was a professional actor for quite some time. I did a, a lot of the commercial things, uh, a lot of the kids shows. I was on uh, the Infinity Factory, which was a program from math, that the metric system that originated out of Boston. Uh, I worked with Joseph Papp Public Theater. And grew up and always knew that I was gay, you know, and when I was playing the kid part, I was always able to play the kid, you know. So when I got around 18, 19, I was in the business and got in between what they call between ages. I, I knew I didn't want to play this game anymore because it was in the late 70s and a lot of blacks didn't have any significant roles on television or in theater or in movies. And I knew I wanted to act, I knew I wanted to do something significant, and I wanted to do something that involved me, being me. So I called myself, I went underground. And uh, I went to an audition, I found an audition for one of the off-off-Broadway plays called Street Theater, which was about the Stonewall Riots of 1969. And it was written by a man named Dark Wilson, who you should also know. Because he wrote a character by the name of Boom Boom in the play, which was a black transgender individual who lived on Christopher Street. Boom Boom and Seal. They were two drag queens. Boom Boom was based on Marsha P. Johnson. Okay. So it was very interesting. My, when I first came into contact with Marsha on my second, last performance at the Mind Shaft. This is where the play was. Have you heard of the Mind Shaft? This is where the play was. The Mind Shaft was in the Mind Shaft bar, and Marsha came to see the play and talked throughout the whole thing. <laughs> Do you remember what year that was? This is 1982. Okay, great. Um, this play was just recently trying to be produced now. We just recently did a reading of it uh, last year uh, because it was lost in the sauce. And, you know, right in 1982, then you had the advent of AIDS. And this was a big comedy, you know, about, but it was a comedy. So no one wanted to laugh in the theater anymore. So, um, so this play was just recently done. They're trying to do it again. Uh, the Paul Boom Boom is a, uh, one of a very proud black transvestite um, 
who says anything that's on her mind. She's the one who actually started the riot in the play. Mm -hmm. um, Marsha, and you know, Marsha was there at the Stonewall riots yes. and was very much a part of it. Um, so you didn't know her at all when she showed up this night? And, and then I said, who is this queen that just won't shut up in the audience? And they said, that's Miss Marsha. And as a matter of fact, Tony Fishnunziata was in the play and Marsha was sitting with his daughter that night, who is now a grown woman with a family of her own. And uh, Tony's always helped Marsha, always been a very good friend of hers. And um, very outspoken. She was, that didn't happen. This was that. <laughs> you know? uh, I remember that. Because it was very historical. We were talking about historical things and points. And like, um, there was one part where it was like, OK, I'll take you to Julius's. And they, they don't help us out, you know. Uh, tell that to Bruno the Bounce of Marsh. He's like, that's right. Tell it to Bruno. So the audience, is this person? So that was my initiation to Marsha. Years later, subsequently, years later, uh, I got a call from Jimmy Canicia to come down and see his cabaret show for thinking about taking over and joining the company. I went down with a friend of mine, and I was impressed by what the company did, but most of all, I was impressed by this person that got up on the stage and did a poem called um, It Doesn't Really Matter If You Ain't Got Soul. Maybe you should ask Jimmy about that poem because she read it from the, thing, from the paper in her hand and couldn't get through it. And the audience was on the floor by the time she finished. This happened all, it usually happened in London also. When we went to London with this same play and Marjorie was with us. They got into the Queen's garden and picked flowers and put them on her hair, in her hair. She like went in on a tour, is that? No, she, she went to... into the garden on her own. <laughs> and we were we back at the hotel and someone is asking questions, the news people, and here goes Marsha on TV. They're asking a question about the Queen, and she's answering it. And I'm like, really? oh my god. Yeah. Now, that, I think, well, that was probably the same trip to London that Amy Coleman that told was, me about. Yeah, Amy was there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you talked to Amy already? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, it was us. That was us. That was that famous hot beach trip yeah. uh, when we did the heat. Um, and Marsha was with us. Because Amy told me about an incident where Marsha, out of the blue, just went wild and went running out of the, uh, I guess it was the theater, and running down the street, but I guess you weren't there. I remember one incident where, she, where I wore a pair of uh, red speckled shorts in the show. And I remember an incident where Marsha in the daytime in London had those shorts on and one of the buses in London almost careened and crashed when <laughs> she was coming down the street in it. So, uh, yeah, I remember there was a lot of incidences with Marsha. My thing was, you know, Marsha, you know, in everything about her, but she, you know, she had her unstable moment. And I was very afraid that, you know, being in another country and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and every, she got through immigration quicker than any of us, mm -hmm. you know. I think she just flew past the person in the immigration, they asked her something and she said something and walked on through. And they didn't want to go through it, so they just let her go. But my thing was I was, I was hoping that she would not have one of her breakdowns mm -hmm. in London and had to be, you know, yeah. put into a hospital and, and they wouldn't have known how to deal with Marsha or, right. you know, in, or what, you know, that was my biggest concern, you know, for her. But she got through it and, uh... Now, when you met, you met Marsha in, in 1982. I met her in 82. And then you didn't have contact with her for a long time? Didn't have contact with her. Only contact I had with Marsha was, uh, going down to the village every once in a while and, seeing her, you know, seeing her on the corner and, and have to see her say like, spare some change, you know, the famous speech, yeah. spare change for dying queen. Yeah. Um, and that's the only contact I have with her until I joined Hot Features again and then became pretty close with her, you know, in London and stuff. And I'll never forget, I answered the phone in Europe when we got the call that Marsha was found dead here in New York. It was on my birthday. I turned 35, and we were in Hamburg, Germany, I'll never forget it, standing in a brothel. And uh, 
I was so excited that it was my birthday. I was 35, and uh, I was in Germany. I was performing. I was doing what I really wanted to do, and I was just happy. I was absolutely happy. And I picked up the phone rang, and it said it was the hot beach, and I got it. And I was like, it was Betty Ford on the phone. And I was like, Betty, how you doing? And we were just, you know, just happy to hear from her. And, you know, we'll get to London soon. And she goes, I want to talk to Jimmy. And I was like, well, Jimmy's not around. He said, did you hear? I said, no, Marsha's been found there. And it just took me like a ton of bricks. And I just absolutely lost it. And up the street, there was a wax museum. Of some kind of wax music, and I didn't know what to do. I was, you know, in a strange place, and I'm crying. So I go up the street, and I go into the wax museum, and there's a statue of Charles de Gaulle. And I'm standing there crying in front of the statue. Now, I got braids in my hand, like huge braids. I'm in Hamburg, Germany. So people are like, who is this black queen crying over Charles de Gaulle? <laughs> then I turned to another famous German figure, and he just booed again. So, they eventually like, ask me to leave, you know, it's all right. You know, maybe you'd be better outside. <laughs> but maybe I would. Then I went up the street where Catch is playing and cried in front of there. So, it was pretty much, you know, a mess. Um, but I'll never forget that night uh, because Marsha had given me a dress before we went on the European tour. Um, beautiful, beautiful dress. And I wore it. Uh, to remember her. I'll never forget how angry I was because here we were somewhere else and we couldn't be here to be part of the protest, to be part of the memorial, to be part of anything that was happening here for her. And I, we just absolutely felt like we were the lost people of the world. And, it, and I knew it was very hard for Jimmy. And I think for me, I got very angry at Jimmy because Jimmy didn't show, I mean, he didn't show any of the emotions that in all of us were having, yeah. you know. But but as I learned later that Jimmy must have hurt the most because, you know, he knew Marsha. He knew, and he knew the struggle, and he knew the story, and he knew everything. So I guess as the leader of the group, he had to really keep himself in some kind of a check. But for me, our relationship deteriorated on that trip because I felt like, oh, well, you know, let's just go and do, you know, and um, we eventually got it back together. You know, after we eventually, oh yeah, we eventually, I love Jimmy. He's got the, you know, it was a hard trip, and he's a very hard person to know, but, but I think Jimmy has seen a lot. He's experienced a lot, and he's been on the forefront of a lot of things, as with his writing, as with his songs, you know, and um, so I respect him, you know, absolutely. But I think it comes to the time when people, two very strong little people, yeah. you know. So we you cussed know, and carried on. I have the, um, I got a copy from Randy. I got a copy of the uh, of the memorial service here in New York for uh, Marshall. Someone put it on video too. Oh. And uh, there's hundreds of people there. Really? Oh yeah, it's really it's a beautiful, uh, it was a beautiful ceremony. Yeah, yeah I'm really sure. Nice. The family spoke and friends and all sorts of people. So. Yeah, and, and no one really still to this day knows what happened. Right. Um, no one knows. Um, I'll never forget when I started to do my solo piece, my performing arts pieces, and I and I always and I did a thing on um, uh, WBAI, and I did spare change for a dying queen, mm -hmm. and I always did it from Marsha's point of view, and uh, I did it in the Bronx. The first time I did it was in the Bronx at nine and twelve gowns, which we have <laughs> up in town. Um, with the poor girls version of it, you know, <laughs> but it's, it's become this huge thing. Oh, really? Yeah, it happens every summer at hey, uh, Coast Coast Community College, and um, all of us from the Bronx, and that first year that I did, the second year I did the show there, yeah, and I did Spare Chain for Dying Queen, and I talked about Marsha, and talked about the people that came from the forefront, you know, and mm -hmm. how they've been forgotten, you know, this whole rich queen phenomena that came along, and queens were being the true transgender people were being shunned and pushed aside and, and not wanting to be seen or heard, you know, not chic, not fashionable. And, and it actually made me very angry, and I, and I talked about it, you know. And that's when I went into a spare change for dying. And 
What kind of reception did he get when you talked about that? Well, you know, um, a lot of people in the audience was like, yeah, yeah. You know, because my thing was, and, and I made a joke of it, I said, you know, you know, Zulu Butch Queen looks like a man and feels like a woman. <laughs> and uh, and I talked from a point of view of, uh, you know, us as a people, you know, like, you know, who came first, who did what, I mean, and, I, and, and, and Spare Change tells you exactly, I mean, you would not be sitting here in all your liberated glory had it not been for those people that put their lives on the line, they had to be out there, they had to be out there like that, in the trench. You know, and I did not appreciate it. And, and you know, as a gay man of African descent myself, and coming from an urban environment, I experienced it. You know, even on a double-edged sword. You know what I'm saying? You know, because there's a, so much concentration. You know, from where I come from, and you know, and I know who's who, and you know, people sneak around and they creep and they do all of this kind of stuff. And, you know, they call you good, and next thing you know, they come for me. You know, like, what are you doing here? Didn't you just catch me out? <laughs> you know? So, um, and even from a standpoint of uh, people who are out, you know, uh, um, people of color who are out, you know, oh, I don't want you around, you know, you're going to, you know, give me up. We're not like that anymore. So what's that about? You know what I'm saying? Um, so, in memory of Marsha, because he had to be out there like that. Yeah, Marsha wasn't hiding anything. Marsha was not, no. <laughs> Marsha was what you saw, was what you got. You know, you know as with crises, as with uh, Lola Star, as with, um, uh, who's the other queen that, um, that you definitely should talk to? Uh, the Spanish. Sylvia Rivera? Sylvia Rivera. Oh, yeah, I'm talking to her all the time. Yeah, yeah. Sylvia is helping me yeah. with this project. Yeah. As with Sylvia, yeah. you know, those are the people who yeah. were out there, who put their lives directly on the line. Uh, speaking of Sylvia, um, Marsha and Sylvia started a group called Star. Star, Street Transvestite yes. Activist What do you know about that, either from Marsha or just in general? I don't know a lot of it about it, but I, I've heard stories about it. Joe could tell you a story. Joe told me a story once that in Jimmy too about they gave this huge benefit for Star. And they raised this money, and Star took the money and gave it to the Queens outside or something like that. And they were like, well, we just did this other day. They were like, well, it was for the Queens doll, you know. But, uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, Jimmy wrote a flag called, um, we did it uh, in 84. It was a play uh, about that, and there was characters in it from the whole Star crew. Oh, really? Yeah. Star yeah. Silver, and they had this big meeting, and, and uh, trying to, it was a, it was a play about trying to get out of New York. The whole AIDS thing in New York. Um, you asked him about it. It's, it's a very good play. It featured all the people from Star. Oh, great. Yeah. So you know that Jimmy's around. Like you know, he's not like traveling somewhere for no, six months. No, Jimmy's here. Oh, good. 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 Jimmy's here. Because he seems to have a lot of uh, information that would be really, really useful. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Jimmy's the person you want to talk to. My stories with Marsha was so Marsha was so sweet to me. She really, really was. You know, we did an interview in London um, um, up with Marsha and this BBC television crew, and we were in the uh, the theater, and Jimmy was talking about, well, you know, if you're a star, what have you got? You know, I mean, you, you become a star, and all you have is the big house and the water in the back. And Marsha was like, well, I'd rather have the water in the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that, like, put that in perspective. Sorry. That's right. No Did Marsha ever talk to you about Stonewall or about experiences there or anything like that? Not that I really remember, and I, I really yeah, didn't I ask her about it. No. Um, no. She didn't. She would always say what was interesting about Martha, she would always say, if you really questioned her about a lot of things, she was like, oh, child, lose my computer. You can't take all this. You know, and they calm, it may calm down. You know, don't leave my computer alone. You know, she was very protective of her not being overloaded. You know. And I understood that because Marsha was holding a lot. You know, yeah. At the same time, she was like living on the street. She was, you know, it would become, you know, it's become very sad at times. Well, the, from the 70s, there's references to Marsha mentioning husband, uh, my third husband, my fifth husband. Uh -huh. Excuse me, but when you knew Marsha, was there anything about relationships with people? 
No, when I knew her, it wasn't. It wasn't. I remember her talking, mentioning husbands and stuff. I think by the time I got to her, she had just got rid of one. You know. Mm-hmm. But no, she never, she never talked about husbands to me. No, she never did. So you went to London together. We went to was London it the same together. tour? Did, did Marsha come back and you went on to Germany, or this was a she different came back tour? and then like a couple years later we went oh, on okay. another tour. Okay. This was with the Christopher Street Columbus tour. Okay. And uh, we did all of Europe and, and stuff like that. But Marsha, when we went, that was the heat. Jimmy's a right. retrospective of his work, and we just went to the drill hall for a month. So we went home. Yeah. I have some of the. Um, the scripts for those that I got that were either in Marsha's belonging. Also, um, Amy sent me a couple of things. Oh, okay. So there's several reviews. There's one review with Marsha right there. Oh, is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with this uh, crown on her head and this white wig. Okay. I think it was. It really doesn't matter if you ain't got soul. Yeah. Was Marsha also an MC in one of these things? Because what I have from her belongings is this this big sort of cardboard thing. That was the thing that she like read. Names. <laughs> oh, that was, <laughs> that okay. was what she read her stuff from. Right. A big heart kind of thing that okay. they knew when she read her stuff on that. Because I also have a videotape. Um, it's both good and bad. Uh, the good thing is, is that it's um, it's various performances of Marsha and Hot Peaches. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, whoever made the tape just did a tape of Marsha, so you don't get to see you the don't view. Get, oh, you just okay. see Marsha. I guess she would come out and she would sort of introduce do everybody. Thing, yeah. And towards the end, she'd come out and say something. Uh-huh. And so it's, it's just a collection of, it's edited, but it's oh, a collection okay. of Marsha coming and going. Well, Jimmy has all of that stuff. He does. You know, he has all of that stuff because it's his group. Right. He has, I'm sure he has the heat, he has all that stuff. Because when I saw the heat, Marsha would only come out at one point okay. and do it really doesn't matter if the gang got so mm-hmm. and the thing that was so amazing about Marsha was it took her 10 minutes to get to the stage and it took another 10 minutes to get herself together to do her part so the audience was beside herself when she started to read and then you could uh you could think you know? mm-hmm. so it was just this whole big performance that culminated into this great yeah but i also have a um a portion of the tape where she sings um, Climb Every Mountain. Oh, right, right. Yeah. So you, you experience oh, right. that? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, no, I think that's such a good way. Oh, yeah, Climb Every Mountain. <laughs> a lot of people, at one point, I think people criticized Jimmy. Uh, like, why would you put her on the spot like that? Why would you do that to her? And like, uh, Jimmy said, that's Marsha. You know, Marsha wants to do this. This is what Marsha she does. She probably wouldn't have done it if she didn't you want know, to, right? Right, she wouldn't have done it. You know, it's one thing you, you can't use Marsha. You know what I'm saying? Marsha came out the better of it, you know. Anything else? Well, anything you have to say? Well, she was a wonderful person. She taught me a lot. I mean, as a black person, as a black queen from an urban environment, just like she was. It taught me to really go on. It really taught me that you know you ultimately have to be who you are, and that's who Marshall was. And the mere fact that Marshall stood there and she fought the fight by standing by, by, by just being her showed me that you know I had to give a lot to transgenderism and for people who stood for who they were and what they were. You know, uh, it meant a lot to me that somebody did that. And she, she was a martyr for it, and, you know, she died for it, you know. Do you think that she's been dead for eight years now? Do you think in that time, do you think people know who she is? Do you think people no, I think they know the history or no, appreciate? No, no, no. no. And that, I think that's what I try to do in my shows, and I try to re- tell people to remember, because, uh, uh, what is that whole expression, if you, if you don't remember, you're damned to repeat it, or right. something like that? Uh, and here we are in this MTV age where these kids, you know, like I said, you know, they, they emulating uh, Britney Spears and, and they're doing, you know, Christina Aguilaria, they're lip syncing to this stuff. These young quick, these young gay kids. And like when I go and when I do Spare Change and when I do some of Jimmy's other pieces or when I do a piece that I do, um, it's coming from a place of history, of history. 
historical facts, and I think that's what needs to happen. You know, these, these kids don't know. They don't know. A lot of these kids were born in 1982. They do not know that the clock stopped in 82. They do not know that the hands of time turned back in 84. They do not know that an entire race of performers, artists, gay people who stood up were gone. So when they were gone, there was no one to stand there. So the ones that were left, others fled. So you had two or three people standing there going, there was this person, there was that person, there was this person. And everybody's going, no, we want to move on. We don't want to know about those. Let's, let's move on. But they're moving on without the historical facts. And I don't think you can do that because, like we said, the Sylvia Rivera stuff. So, there are people who don't even know. This, okay, there was a situation that happened um, the other, a uh, couple of months ago. I was in a, at the point in the Bronx, and, and this young queen was talking to me. She was like, do you know so and so? I said, no. She goes, do you know so and so? I said, no. Do you know Marky Russell? I said, no. I said, but do you know Judy Turner? She goes, no. I said, mm, mm, mm. You know, it's the same way. It's like, do you know Marsha Johnson? Do you know Sylvia Rivera? These queens don't know that. I think they, they're at a loss. They're truly at a loss. Because historically, they don't know. There's a chunk of it that was left out. And there's not a lot of people who can tell them because they're not here. So, so that's why I'm interested in Marsha's story. Yeah. Because it's almost a universal story. Uh huh. And, um,. Trying to piece it all together, yeah. but of course, the, the kind of life that Marsha lived, it's it's difficult to get it all right. together. But it, it's happening. I mean, yeah. talking, everybody seems to know some other person. Oh yeah, you know, it's like um, a Ehab Hutton line. Yeah, <laughs> and it's important that it's told. And it's important that her life story be told. It's important. Whatever you put together about her is good enough because it's more. We don't have that. You know, when. Like I said, when, when, when we start emulating and getting our heroes from MTV, you know, I, I, as gay people, I think, you know, there's something missing. And just like with black folks with slavery, orally, I think the history is passed on. And a lot of times now, you know, no one wants to orally pass it on. No one, because everyone's too fabulous to even care and hear it. You know. One of the reasons why I'm taking this, first of all, it's easier that I don't have to take notes and I can just then transcribe it, is um, even if, if I can't get what I need to really put it together as a book or something, um, I will put all the tapes and all the information I have in the gay and lesbian archive, uh -huh. where in the future people who might be doing research about Stonewall, right. transgender movement, right. uh, gay movements, all different things that Marsha was involved in, right. will be able to go and find the information. Good, good. So, because good. up to now, Marsha's life is really not documented. Right. Um, people mention her, but no one really knows. Yeah. Um, Marsha was in uh, the Naval Reserve. I mean, how many people knew that? I didn't know that. Yeah. And so, I'm piecing these things yeah. together to try and, and see what how, how this life was lived from, yeah. you know, birth until death. Uh, that's and, really wonderful. Um, the family um, is very helpful, but I've told them that I, I want to talk to other people first um, before I get into the whole childhood and work with them. But um, his sister Norma, her name is, she still lives in Elizabeth, New Jersey, uh -huh. and um, she very much wants to help out with any kind of information. That she I, I, I understood the family was very supportive. Yes, very supportive. Very supportive. Yeah. Marsha was a loving individual. Yeah. You know, Marsha was a loving individual, and I'm sure she ended up. I mean, she got out of Elizabeth. You know, mm -hmm. I mean. <laughs> you gotta get out of Elizabeth. Marsha's uh, sister, uh, Norma, told me a funny story that um, the only thing Marsha's mother said was, is, I just don't want you wearing women's clothes here. Uh -huh. That's the only rule. Uh -huh. I don't care. You're gay, whatever. Right. No women's clothes. And um, Marsha, of course, didn't abide by the rule. And uh, one of uh, Marsha's nephews was playing, I guess, in front of the house with uh, some friends. And um, Marsha was coming up the street, all dressed, you know, the whole deal. And somebody made a comment, um, and the nephew said, "That's not a woman. That's my uncle Mikey." And the other kids were like, "No, that's a woman. That's my uncle Mikey." <laughs> 
That's great. <laughs> so Marsha was, you know, open <laughs> yeah. to her family and you know, yeah. they were very Yeah, you know, that's the same with me. It's like, you know, and that's important because that gave her a chance to go on. Right. And that gave her to be, you know, who she was. Yeah. I just wish, I don't know when uh, the, the situation started when she started to have the episode. Well, that's a question that maybe Jimmy can help me because um, the family told me that in childhood, you know, the sister said, you know, there was no problem. And then somewhere along the line, Marsha was having a breakdown, she was receiving treatment, she was in hospital. So I'm going to try to, I do interviews, I'll, I'll meet somebody well, along the line. that could come with life itself. Yeah. It's just being who you are. And in that period, there's just so much, so much something you can take. Yeah. You know, just like now, you know, I work, uh, <laughs> I work with uh, uh, retarded adults. Um, I work for the Department of Development and Disabilities, and it's a godsend for me because when all my consumers are in the room talking to themselves, I can talk to myself. <laughs> you know, I act up right along with them. Is this in like a group home or something? Yeah, in a group home oh, setting. Oh, nice. You know, and there's always something. One, <laughs> I, I, I did, uh, I was, uh, one time I was talking to someone, and I went, ah! Like, What's the matter? I said, oh, nothing. Just remembering something from my childhood. And I said, where were you? <laughs> so I think as a gay person who is out, who lives in an urban environment as Marsha was, and who come from a black family, you know, there are a lot of situations that we deal with, you know what I'm saying, that traditionally are a very different, you know, I think, um, I don't want to turn out turn this, but traditionally white gay people, I think, leave home and become, and come out. Whereas, <laughs> oh, right there in the house, with it, you know, and cooking in the kitchen and all that, and, and yeah, eventually we no, no. Because I think that we, as um, me, myself, and all my friends who grew up with me, we emulated our aunts and our mothers, and, you know, and, and people like that. Jimmy used to always tell me, you know, your drag is so tired, and you, know, you always want to be like your aunt oh at church. And I'm like, but she was fabulous! <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, you know, so, you know, we, we always do that, so, you know, we don't traditionally go towards right. other, you know, the people you know, to emulate, you just start the emulation side from the home. But that makes them a good character, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I was being the Aunt Delma, and, you know, and they go, go ahead, baby, sing, baby, you know, and I stand up on the chair, and I'm back, because Aunt my suit. So it was just always natural. Mm -hmm. You know, so somebody told me, stop. <laughs> no, it's not going You know. So, uh, so I can understand what I'm like, you know, we're always just ourselves, you know, and, and you don't know what you gave me. So I said, you're gay. Like, oh. <laughs> I am. You know. So, yeah, Marsha, I'm sure, like the whole family and everything, you know. Alright, well, let's see. A few more minutes. Okay. Do you want to walk over there? Yeah. Alright, I'll turn this off. Okay.